Enduro bikes for many people are the perfect blend of winch up and bomb down. We've arrived at them by incremental changes to trail bikes, progressively making them more and more aggressive. But what if we came at the problem from the other end? What if we started with a downhill bike, turning it up to 11 and then backed it off half a turn? How do we make one of these bikes our one bike to rule them all? So what are we dealing with? This is a nuke proof descent and it is a bona fide downhill bike with an uncompromising approach to downhill handling. Now with a downhill bike like this, there are three main areas that it differs from your enduro bike. First of all, the gearing, and that is a big one. The second thing is the geometry and the third is the weight. So let's talk about these three issues and find out if they are really that far apart. Downhill bikes tend to have big chain rings and small tight ratio cassettes. Perfect for going downhill and having smooth, consistent shifts, even under load. But not great for winching up long fire roads or steep pinches. So the first thing that we need to do is add a wide range cassette, more gears going from seven to 12, and also change the shifter to match. A bike like this relies typically on a gondola or uplift service to do the heavy lifting for you. But now in the big world of enduro, you've got to earn your turns. So undoubtedly fitting a 10 to 50 tooth cassette, as well as an itsy bitsy chain ring, are gonna make it far easier to get yourself to the top of the climb. But is that it? Have I solved the problem in one fell swoop? You're probably sat at home now screaming at your screen saying, Henry, you're never shutting up about geometry. That's surely got to count too. And of course it does, but the differences might not be quite as big as you imagine. Reach, effective top tube, chain steel length and stack are surprisingly all within a couple of mil of each other. The biggest difference is the seven millimeters in effective top tube length. But how do the angles themselves compare? Now, of course, the downhill bike is slacker, but only by a degree and a half. This one coming in at 63 degrees. Interestingly enough, it's also only one degree slacker in the seat tube, which is actually quite stark because it's those kind of differences we often talk about from brand to brand of enduro bikes. So the riding position could be quite similar, but the seat post is far, far shorter, which could limit you with two things. Firstly, your fit and just getting comfortable on the bike. And secondly, finding a dropper seat post with the appropriate amount of drop for you. So that's gearing and geometry, but what about the third factor? What about weight? Well, I would contend that many enduro bikes, at least ones raced at a high level, actually don't come that much shy of that 17 kilo build on the downhill bike. And I think even with this EWS winning nuke proof mega, in this build, although it is a bit lighter, there aren't that many differences. Sure, you go to a single crown fork and this bike does have slightly lighter wheels and tires. But apart from that, the builds are actually quite similar. And dare I say it, if you were to take this bike to Whistler or Finale, you probably would end up putting a very similar spec to its rowdy cousin over there. When talking about that 17 kilo total weight, there are some culprits that are easy to identify, such as, for instance, the whopping coil shock. Now, coil shocks on enduro and trail bikes are so in right now, obviously, because they're everywhere and a bit of a trend. But a downhill bike like this could indeed have an air shock, so you could lose some weight there. It's also really, really worth noting that I haven't gone gram hunting on this bike, and it would be interesting to see just how light you could get it. Recently, a friend of mine built up an enduro bike in downhill spec, and it came over 19 kilograms. So enduro bikes can definitely tip the scales and threaten bikes like this when it comes to the heavyweight title of who can tip the most at the scales. Now, two things to note about this dropper post setup on this downhill bike is the insertion depth into the frame isn't really as much as I'd like. Now that has two consequences. Firstly, I'm only just over the minimum insertion for the post itself. And secondly, even though I've got all this real estate here, I can only fit a 150 mil drop. And that's because any longer and it wouldn't actually pass the minimum insertion mark. Okay, so now it's time for a half-time intermission. So the weather gods struck again, and I just don't get it. I mean, we obviously love to film in the rain, don't we? But it's the camera equipment doesn't allow us. I mean, we will be here hell or high water, but it's, it's the cameras, sadly. 
Now, we might have been able to get away with it had I not been out of sync with my washing, so I've had to come clean in more ways than one. And the couple of weeks in between has actually given me plenty of food for thought. Because I was thinking, on the little bit of riding that I did, one issue quickly became apparent. The saddle in both positions was just too high. Descending, I didn't have enough clearance. And when it was in its highest position, I was pedaling, I was stretching and reaching and on my tippy toes and going through it like a Russian ballet dancer. It was really no good. So I thought to myself, what can I do to circumvent this problem? Well, I don't actually have any seat post with a shorter amount of drop in this diameter. So I thought I'd have to think outside the box. And then it occurred to me, maybe some of my shoes have different stack heights than others. So I did some quick measuring and I found out the shoes I'm wearing today have about, I'd say four or five mil stack height difference compared to the slender options I was in before. So I've kind of gone down the road of Disco Stew and Mel B with the old platform Disco Shoes, but I think it could be a great option and could provide valuable comfort and clearance. So what's on the cards today? Well, we're gonna be comparing this, of course, to an enduro bike. And how are we gonna do that? Well, I have devised the Henry Quinney Enduro Enjoyrometer to find out how these bikes stack up. So we're gonna take this bike into different settings and compare it with a score out of five. So that will be a single track climb, such as this, a fire road winch. Then we're gonna bomb a downhill run, which I think it will be perfectly capable at, just a sneaking suspicion, and then we're gonna ride some smoother trails, because isn't that the place where the bike could come undone? On trails like this that aren't too demanding on the bike, and maybe it could be a little lifeless compared to something short to travel. But this is what the edge of your seats were made for, so if you wanna scoot forward a little bit, we're gonna do some enduroing. Enjoy rowing. Enduro, enduro, enjoy rowing. Ring. So climbing on this bike is actually quite reminiscent of some kind of Land Rover Defender or something. Lots of grip, small gears, and if you're patient, you'd be surprised at what you can get up. Probably not the quickest, but the amount of grip really is quite remarkable. Although on the flip side, it does respond to any surge of enthusiasm or power like an old bureaucratic institution and could be well on the way to replacing the oil tanker and any old cliched metaphors about things taking their time to get going. The grip is there, but you do want quite a small set of gears because you will need to spin your way up things. As Soon as you put the power down, it's like stepping in a plate full of blancmange. You only go south. It takes a little while to build it up to get moving. So what does that mean and how does it compare on the actual trail? Well, on a single track climb like this, you do of course notice the weight, especially with all these little dips, undulations that require a bit of acceleration from the rider. Now, in terms of the wheelbase, this bike is of course quite long, but at 12.65, it's not crazy long by today's enduro standards, although it might have been balked at even a few years back. What that means is out on the trail, short radius turns like this aren't so much of a problem. The issue is when you get something that is quite a tight turn that is also rough. Because the bike isn't designed with any intention to have that pedaling platform that's gonna give you lots of support, should you need to give it a sudden impetus to surge up a little step or the like. So that means you've got to pick your battles a little bit more and really think ahead. But like I said, you'd probably be surprised just largely in thanks to the huge amounts of grip. Now, be under no illusions, this is no XC rig. And if I was riding with other people trying to keep up, it would undoubtedly be very taxing. But it ain't half bad. And it's actually a very enjoyable bike to ride. What does it score on the Henry Quinney Enduro Enjoyrometer? I would say a very respectable three out of five. The weight holds it back and it's never what this bike was built for. I think on trails like this are fine, but if you ask me to go a little bit quicker and get out that 50 tooth at the back, I would be quite unhappy about that, to be frank. I think actually cruising comfortably like this is one thing, but if you were to try and push it, I think the shortcomings of a downhill bike on a climbing trail would quickly become apparent. But onto the fire road test and let's enjoy some more enduro. So 
So now for the fire road comparison. And on smooth, relatively flat fire roads like this, it's an absolute pleasure actually, because you don't really notice the weight. However, this might be a different story. You see, whereas a switchback climb has the switchbacks in it to eke out the gradient and make it a bit more friendly on your legs, fire roads can often almost go as the crow flies. And for logging trucks, in some places are relentlessly steep. This one, about 13, 14% isn't too drastic, but any steeper, and I think the rather modest 17 kilo-ish build weight would really start to hold you back. It also means that as that weight wants to slow you down, you're almost perpetually accelerating. And that is where the bike with that coil shock that gives you lots of grip does tend to bob a bit. Like I said, with the climbing on the single track, riding this by myself at my own pace isn't too bad. But if I had to keep up with anyone else, I think it'd be a short road to a heart attack, if nothing else. Now that's not to say that other enduro bikes don't come in at the 17 kilo-ish region, or at least threatening to do so. But they tend to come with some vital differences, not least a shock with a climb switch, which I'll be very thankful for right now. So how does the downhill bike score on the Enjoyro scale for the fire road? I think it is a two. I think it's a two out of five. And that's because it's taking what is already quite a laborious process and making it even more so. Secondly, if this was any steeper or I wasn't just pottering around the woods doing a couple of runs, I think it would be fatiguing beyond all belief but I think this is the area that could be most easily improved upon. And I'm gonna come back to that later on. But let me get my breath back and on to the next comparison. Riding a bike so capable on trails as mellow as this, well, it's not a particularly exciting experience and it ventures into the realms of boredom hitherto untouched, except for whatever reality TV program they're on at the moment. I think it's Love Island 6, Return of the VD. Either way, the bike demands so much more and it's a shame not to give it to it. So I'm gonna persevere. I'm gonna do a full run and see if things liven up a bit. But I expect the huge amounts of grip, the slow, soft tires aren't really gonna to be too exciting on something as mellow as this. Riding a bike that is undoubtedly as capable as this on a trail that is on the, on the more mellow side just feels like a wasted opportunity. It'd be like asking Carol Vorderman to recite her two times tables. It just isn't anywhere near the limit of what they can do. The problem is there's no grip for the bike to try and find. There's no stability for that long wheelbase to try and seek. And so it all just feels very easy and on a plate. And personally, I can only speak personally, that's not what I ride mountain bikes for. So what out of five? Well, truthfully, I think even an enduro bike is a little bit overkill for something like that, but a downhill bike, it just makes it even duller over. So I'm gonna give it a commendable, but a predictable two out of five. That was quite, maybe it will tickle some people's pickle, but for me, it just wasn't enough. So here we are at the home of the downhill bike, the downhill run. And I'm going to award it, before I've even ridden it, the score of six out of five, because it's just so good. Anyway, moving on. Is that it? I mean, I suppose I could probably just get, just get the one run in, you know, when in Rome and all that. Oh, downhill bikes are just so good.
<laughs> that was so good. Downhill bikes are just, I love them, mate. I absolutely love them. Now, all that talk of tickling pickles has given me a hankering for a plowman's lunch. So I think we're gonna go back to the cafe, reconvene and really address the question. How suitable is it to have your downhill bike as the one bike to do it all? So we've had our time in durifying the downhill bike. And how have we got on and how does it compare? Well, to go off on a brief tangent, I once heard that Dolly Parton lost a Dolly Parton lookalike contest to a drag queen. And that actually illustrates the point here because that is almost a caricature of an enduro bike. It's so exaggerated for better and for worse. But that being said, it's actually far more convincing as an enduro bike than some enduro bikes I've ridden, if that makes any sense at all. I think the point of enduro bikes a lot of the time is to winch up and bomb down. And I think this makes a very strong argument for that. The problem is, whilst it does both effectively, it really would be a, a downhillers enduro bike, very much so. I think if you were somebody that rode the lifts all the time and find yourself having to do the odd traverse, it would be perfect. For me, I think genuinely, and you're probably gonna smirk yourself silly watching this, I think if that had an air shock with a climb switch, something like a Zeb or a 38 on the front, as well as a longer insertion depth on the seat tube, it would actually make a more comprehensive argument still. Even riding some of that rough stuff, I felt myself getting just nudged forward slightly by the seat post, and it's very disconcerting. It's something I really don't like. So is that the full package? Absolutely not. But do I think that dialing it back from 11 from that extreme place of a downhill bike is a valid thing, I think it's been rather eye-opening. And like I said, I think it would surprise many at just how much better it is at enduro than some bloody enduro bikes. Now, thank you very much for watching this explorative and interesting video, I hope, about the merits of butchering something that is so pure into something that can do so much more. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.